Have you ever wondered why people think it's important to study the Bible? That's what we'll talk about today. We are dealing with God's thoughts. We are obliged to take the greatest pains to understand them truly and explain them clearly. D.A. Carson. Today we're going to talk about studying the Bible, and we'll do some deeper dives and different ways to study the Bible. Keeps it fresh, gives you different viewpoints. I've learned a lot by different methods of studying the Bible. But in this episode, we're going to talk about the book How to Study the Bible for Yourself by Tim LaHaye. I really didn't know where to start when I became a Christian on reading the Bible. When I realized I believed in Jesus and I was sitting in my dorm room, I decided I had to know what it was that I believed. I'd never read the New Testament. I've only seen parts here and there, but now I had to read it for myself. So I did a deep dive over the course of a very long weekend and read the New Testament from beginning to end. I had done quite a bit of studying on the Old Testament because I was Jewish, and I took a lot of Hebrew and biblical Hebrew, and I spent two summers in Israel. I felt pretty strong about my knowledge of the Old Testament, started going through different tools for that. At some point, I started working for InterVarsity, which is a Christian college organization, and had some great mentors. Terry Morrison was one of them. And he helped me quite a bit on my journey with Christianity. He wanted me to learn about different methods of reading the Bible and studying the Bible and trying to get different perspectives out of it. So that's when I decided I wanted to know more about how to do it properly. The one thing that I saw that was striking about the Bible is there's no code there. There are some things that are harder to understand because the wording is different. Or sometimes in Hebrew, the words are actually quite different. Or even that sometimes there's mistranslations, like the Red Sea was probably the Reed Sea. But for the most part, what God wants and the messages that are told in the story, quite clear. The first thing that gathered from the Bible is that every story in there, or every person or every action, wasn't meant to be an example. People will talk about how David failed how Moses failed. Those are also meant to be lessons when people fail and when they do the right thing. So it makes us try to grow and understand exactly what it is we believe and what it is God wants from us. And what Tim said, and that's why this book struck me quite a bit when I read it a long time ago, he says, quote, unfortunately, many Christians have the idea they can't understand the Bible. They think it was written for theologians or ministers. So all they do is listen to Bible scholars lecture and preach or read books about the Bible. They spend very little time actually studying it for themselves. But he goes on later to say that it's meant to be read by normal, regular people. And I think that God provided it to us so that we could take away lessons. The thing that struck me quite a bit when I was hiking in England is we came upon a tower that was called the Tyndale Tower. And Tyndale was the guy who translated the Bible into English. And that didn't go over very well. He eventually lost his life because of this translation. But bringing the Bible to the common human being was such an amazing task. Luther did it for German people, and Tyndale did it for English-speaking people. And what that meant is all the way up to the time these translations happened, the average person couldn't read it. The texts were in Greek, Latin, Aramaic, Hebrew, and most of your common people obviously couldn't read those languages. So you relied on experts to tell you what exactly was in the Bible. And if they just wanted to skip a few topics because it kind of convicted them or maybe took away some of their authority, they skipped it. But once the Bible became something we could read, and it's only probably been 200 years, depending on what language it is you speak, Luther was somewhere in the mid-1500s, Tyndale, I think, was in the late 1800s, 1875-ish. So people didn't have the opportunity. Today we do, and we should take up that opportunity to read it. 
Most of the times when you read the Bible, like I said, there's some background stories, but Jesus is very clear about what he means. Jesus is very clear about what the kingdom of God is about, and it is meant for us to read. He gives some advice in the book. He makes some general suggestions for reading the Bible. He thinks that you should read it every day. He thinks that it's helpful to set a dedicated time. And if you remember episode 11, I talked about the Dutch act of silence and quietude. And it's a great time to practice that while reading the Bible. It says it's good if you set a regular place. Again, in episode 11, she suggested that you pick a holy place. You have a place of worship, candle, quiet, calm, and that's where you go to study the Bible. But I don't want to make it too complicated. So if you just have a regular place to study it, it's good so that you have it all sitting there ready for you to read. Tim says that it's good if you have pencil, paper in hand so that you can start taking notes. Some people like to write in their Bibles. I think it's great on one hand because I've heard so many people say that they have their grandparents, their parents, their ancestors' notes written in Bible. And so you could see what other people thought of it. I'm kind of a digital girl. And so unfortunately, a lot of my notes are in a digital format. I guess in a sense, it makes me sad because I know that if something were to happen to me, my notes are gone along with my digital account. He says that we should read it devotionally. And that means, you know, considering it a loving God has given this, that we are meant to adore God and do it with this attitude of worship. I think that helps when you're trying to read the Bible and understand it fully. I tend to sit down with the Bible and think about it very intellectually. It's kind of how I roll. I'm very practical and intellectual. And so I'm trying to understand the words and I look up this word in the Hebrew and I look up that. And I think that is a way of studying the Bible. But I understand the point of being in that worship mode when reading the Bible gives a whole new perspective on it. He suggests, too, that you keep a spiritual diary. I use day one, and I keep my notes in there. But I know that a lot of people, and particularly when this book was written, expect paper, a diary, a notebook, something that you would have that you could write without getting the digital things out. You know, I know that I love that, and I love keeping notes digitally, but I know that even when I'm using a dedicated Bible app, I have all my other little apps sitting there staring at me, my Twitter, my emails, so I understand what it is that it means to write things down. He says if we do keep a spiritual Bible, it'll do some good things for us. It will be a place where we can record our insights, you know, as we're doing our Bible study. We can also know what to expect from God. What are the promises? What are the things that he expects from us? And it's a way that we can also check in of how we're doing. If we're struggling with a sin in our journal, we can talk about how we're handling it, what's been helping and what hasn't been helping. And then it gives you a chance to see spiritual growth in you. You know, if there were a time where you were worried or concerned and you're starting to come through that, a spiritual journal can certainly help. There are a lot of different methods about reading the Bible, and the book goes through some of them, and we will talk about that in the future. You know, for example, you can read a book by book and just start at the beginning and go through the end. Sometimes that's hard because you get kind of caught up in a particular area. Like you can get into the bagats for a really long time, and sometimes it's hard to keep interest. Even though you know the bagats are teaching you a lineage of God's family, it's still sometimes rather difficult. I know that I got caught up with all the different land grants that the tribes of Israel were given, and then you're suddenly losing interest. So there might be some other ways to go about it. You can read a particular book, you know, like maybe focus on John or focus on a topic. There's topical types of studies. And there's times where you can read it based on what's going on in your life. If you're struggling with worry, then maybe it's time to read the passages and the areas where people worried, that kind of thing. There's a lot of ways to tackle the Bible. Again, it's a really big book. If you buy it, I think in an audio version, I think like 22 hours long. So it is a very big piece. 
I started this year by listening to the Father Schmidt's podcast where he goes through the Bible in an entire year. And that's been helpful to me. It's engaging and he's a good explainer of what things mean. I'm not Catholic, so there are some points where I disagree with what he's saying, but 95% of the time I'm understanding and agreeing with what he says. Some ways that you have to go about when you're reading the Bible is to make sure that you do it when you don't feel like doing it. It's not every day where you really feel like reading the Bible. It can be moods that you're in or days that you just don't feel like doing it. I kind of had a rough day today, and now it's Friday and I need a break. It's certainly interesting to me to just sort of relax and not think about reading the Bible, but I'm going to do it anyway. He says, too, that you can talk to God about what you want to commit. He actually uses the word vow. Boy, vows are big deals, and vows to God are even a bigger deal. So that one makes me hedge a little bit. But I think it's the same kind of practice that you do a lot of things you don't like to do, maybe like exercising or eating healthy. You know, you need that commitment to grow in your faith. And so giving that commitment, whether you decide to make a vow or not, I think is a good step. He goes through different parts of the Bible. Of course, when we start out at the beginning of the Bible, we have what's called the history, which is obviously Genesis, talking about the beginnings. Then comes the law, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then we get into a lot of history, and the history books are considered to be Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. There's wisdom poetry, which is considered to be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We get into the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and then the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So there's ways that you can also break up the books by their overall themes, how it is that they represent God's word. I think what's great about God's word is for me, I'm a real practical person. I love history and I don't mind law very much. So those are good books for me. But, you know, sometimes people are into poetry. Sometimes people are into wisdom and proverbs. So there's something really for everyone and every kind of thought that goes into how people think or what really appeals to people in the Bible. A little something for everybody. Then when it comes to the New Testament, of course, there's 27 books. And we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for the gospel. The history of the church would be Acts. We have the letters of Paul. We have other epistles or other James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. And then there's prophecy, which is, of course is revelation. So those are also other ways we can break up the Bible and do a kind of study of that. And so there's another way we can break up the New Testament into smaller chunks. He talks about the silence years. There are about 400 years that occurred between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a long time to have silence. In retrospect, you think, well, that's not so bad, 400 years. The Israelites in Exodus waited a long time. But to have God be quiet for that period of time probably was pretty tough on people. And so when we started getting the word out of Jesus and the promise of the Messiah, people were expecting it. That's the amazing thing about all of it. People were still waiting for the Messiah. People were still reading scriptures about the Messiah. 400 years later, they were counting on the promise of God. He says in the book that you can pick different ways of studying the Bible. You could choose a book. You can choose the Bible. You can pick an easy book. Sometimes it's better to get into something when something's a little bit easier. He mentions that Revelation, 1 Peter, Hebrew, Romans are very complex. But 1 John, 1 Thessalonians, the Gospel of John are a little bit easier to read. So that might be another tactic that you can take when picking it. 
Or again, you can select what he calls a today book, which means that today you really need to hear the Gospels. Or maybe you need to hear the promise that God will be with us always. You can certainly pick something that's ready for you. He says some good questions to ask when you're starting out and looking at the Bible is, who wrote this particular book? And what was the circumstance? You know, John, when he wrote Revelation, was abandoned on the island of Patmos. And when we see Luke, he was writing by interviewing people. He'd never witnessed any of this. So he had a different point of view. If they were letters, who were the letters being written to? And why were these letters so important to this particular group? When was this particular book written? You know, about what were the major problems it was trying to solve? What were the solutions that were given? And what's the central message that will help us today? We talked about that where Paul's concern were for these new churches that were struggling with either fighting or falling away from the church, worshiping other gods, or doing other things that went against each other. So if we understand the point of why he's reading the book to the group that he is, it can help us understand what the message to us will be too. He says that when we're reading a chapter, then we can ask the question, what's the main subject of this chapter? Who are the main people involved in this particular chapter? What does it say about Christ? What are the key points or the main verses? What is the central lesson? What are the main promises, the main commands? What should we avoid? Are we being warned away from certain activities by this book? Are there examples? And question I now ask myself, now that I know that not every example was a good example, is it a good example or a bad example? Was that person following God or were they rebelling against God? And then asking really the important question, what's the most important thing I can take away from this chapter to apply to my life right now? He says sometimes we can do a topical study, a character study, if we're trying to investigate and do a deep dive. But topical studies are good too. What is the message of grace? What's our message of forgiveness? How should we be a community together? And how should we treat our brothers? That's all good topics to discuss when looking at the Bible. He says if we want to, we could start looking at some of the Psalms. Many of the Psalms, I think a majority of them, were written by David. I just got through on that daily podcast getting through the parts where we were talking about David, and we're not quite done yet. Psalms is not my favorite part of the Bible. Again, I'm a pretty practical person, but he says so many times, hear my prayer or let me come to you. Don't hide your face from me. It's stunning, this closeness that David felt towards God. And you can understand why God said that David was a man after his own heart. He gives some tools for doing a good Bible study. First of all, you need a good Bible. And we'll talk at some point about the different translations. I do ESV. That's the translation I picked right now. I used to do NIV, the 1984 version, but sometimes people like King James and how wonderful it is as a translation. Certainly the new King James that was published in 1982 is more readable, I think, to us now in the modern time, but sometimes people love the ancient language of the old New James version. It's up to you what you like. There's obviously the message, and a lot of people have problems with the message. Because it's the book that, it's the translation written with the goal of making it the easiest to read for normal people. It's more like what we would expect in modern language. But again, Hebrew and Aramaic and even Greek and Latin, they're not modern languages. And so sometimes you lose meaning when you modernize it, and you may even lose significant, important meanings. So I do enjoy having that kind of book and reading it, but I also keep another Bible right next to me. So in case I feel like this is maybe not exactly the way it was translated, I can get a quick reference to understand if this is actually really what it meant, what it really said. But again, there's my analytical mind. There's the Word in Life translation, which I think is New King James. But 
everything in the comment fields are focused a lot towards occupation. I knew the fellow who started that project, and he was very clear that only a very few people were hired ministers, pastors. Most everyone else had occupations. So he wanted to clearly show in this book that people of every occupation has a place in God's kingdom to teach other people and to grow in the faith. And study Bibles in general are a good way to go too. There are history study Bibles, women's study Bibles, men's study Bibles. There's study Bibles that go into a deep dive to compare certain aspects. I think there's even an archaeology study Bible, which I also have, but I haven't read yet. Because I love archaeology. I spent a summer on an archaeological dig. I even found a pet cemetery in Ashkelon. But archaeology and what was found and what terms meant at that time great to learn too. So there's a lot of directions you go. So if you can pick a Bible that really gives you some significance, helps you read the Bible, I think that's a great place to go. I use a software called Logos, which is my digital Bible. Another neat Bible that you can use for study is there's a coloring Bible. And so you can fill in the stylized first letters of the paragraph. There's Pieces of art built inside relevant to the chapter, which you can get your pencils out and start filling them in. So all sorts of creative ways of reading the Bible. I think the Bible that makes the most sense is going to be an accurate Bible and the one you'll read. If coloring in with pencils makes you read it, then break out the pencils. If that tilt towards archaeology gets you interested in to keep in reading it, go for that too. He says that you could have a reference Bible nearby in case you need to look something up. There's what he calls the Halley's Bible Handbook, but I know that there are some other ones out there like Airdman's. Having some kind of a reference book that shows you what it means when someone talks about a lamp or when someone talks about an olive tree in the Bible. What did it mean back then? He mentions a concordance, and I think concordances are very good. An exhaustive concordance is mostly like an index that shows you every place that marriage was talked about in the Bible or every place we talked about loving your brother in the Bible. So there can be topical concordances or word concordances. But if you're looking for another point of view to help you understand what it is you're reading, then a concordance can help you give other passages related to what you see right now. A Bible dictionary will help you look up words that maybe you don't know the answer to, and some of them even have some good photographs and some images that will help you get through it. He says that there are one-volume commentaries out there. I know there's a lot, like um, Strong's uh, commentary, I believe, that's out there. There's a lot of really good commentaries, and so you can talk to your pastor about a commentary that seems appropriate. He mentions, too, that even when you take the Bible literally, there's ways of making sure that you keep it in context. He says, watch for idioms or the way the language is structured. Talk about figurative language. Even people who are biblical literalists understand that there are figurative speech, metaphors, similes, parables, examples, analogies, hyperbole, and personifications. It doesn't mean that the Bible is not literally true or true at all, but the language makes it more interesting when you hear things, I think, as analogies and even in parables. Another part that a lot of people emphasize, and this comes in to people who went to Sunday school when they were young kids, is memorization. A lot of people talk about memorizing passages, writing them down, quizzing yourself on the passages. And the reason to do that is it helps when you're confronted with sin, if you have Bible passages off the top of your head, or you're confronted with worry and suddenly you're just overwhelmed. It helps to know that you have Bible passages at the tip of your brain that you can bring out at those times when you're particularly stressed, worried, or in despair. 
he brings out that it's helpful too when you're sharing the gospel with people to have memorized passages. And while my friend had some nerves about sharing the gospel with me, she had a number of memorized passages she got from when she was in Sunday school and through her confirmation classes. So when I asked her questions, she was able to rapidly bring up answers to some of those questions because she had them memorized. I've not done a great job of memorizing passages, but for her, it is such a useful tool to talking to other people. And he says that if you do want to memorize some scriptures, Rick Warren talks a lot about this too, is to write them on cards, maybe have an app that does a flashcard type test for you. I like apps, as you probably guessed. And then start memorizing them, learning them. You'll start out with the gist of what they are, and eventually you'll get to the passages word by word, and then remember the chapter and verse of those. So I hope that helps and gives an introduction to the Bible and why it's important to read. I think there's just no better shield to protect us from evil, to protect us from worry and despair, and to give us that close relationship with Jesus. That's the best reason of all, because we understand what he thinks, how he thinks, and how he would like us to think too. So my challenge to you is start with something easy, maybe the Gospel of John, and read it through a study method. Get your notepaper out, get your notebook out, and start dedicating a time every day where you can sit down, maybe for a half hour, so that you can read part of the Bible Meditate on it. Again, that's that word rumination where you're turning it around in your head and then doing the journaling with the spiritual journal so that you can record your thoughts, record what that means to you, and go through what the chapters meant, who it was written by, and some of the notes that he mentioned earlier. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can subscribe to the podcast if you go to smallstepswithgod.com, but it also uploads to YouTube. You can listen to the podcast on my website as well, but it is also available on all major podcast services. Thanks for listening. And remember that reading the Bible starts with small steps for sure.